Welcome to welcome to the second part of Bloom's Day if you're here in person. Welcome to Bloom's Day if you're on Zoom. Um, this, of course, is the 100th anniversary of James Joyce's Ulysses. Bloom's Day is the day on which uh, the book takes place, if you haven't read it. Um, so that would be June 16th. And all over the world, and maybe you, we can speak about this in, in the event, all over the world there are celebrations happening in Dublin, in, so in Ireland, in Hungary, in Trieste, uh, in Zurich, Switzerland. So in other words, we, we, we're kind of part of a larger movement that's happening across the world. And we're the Paris contingent. And we feel very proudly about this because of reasons that Adam will briefly speak to. Um, it was Shakespeare and Company and the, the book was first published in Paris 100 years ago. So you're at the epicenter of the celebration and there are kind of uh, satellite celebrations around the world. Um, Another raising of hands, who's listened to the podcast, Bloomcast? Hello, hello, fans. <laughs> um, and, and Zoom, hello, if, you, if, you, if you're here because you've listened to our podcast. I'm going to sit down. Um, this, is our tenth, this is our tenth episode. Um, and the idea of this episode, we've all finished the book. Someone asked me outside, have you, have you actually read it now? And I said, yes. <laughs> yes, I will, yes. Um, this, so, so we're kind of reflecting on our experience, having read it, um, having had this experience with all of you. Um, and the idea is really to kind of use your presence here, your presence on Zoom uh, and our presence as a way to just reflect. I mean, we, we often structure, although it might not seem like it in the podcast, they're very planned. Um, this, this evening, we have some kind of fun guiding questions that we will ask each other, um, but we really just want to kind of relax and, and hear what you will have to say as well. Can you, would you like to add anything? Well, you're going to introduce each other. Well, yeah, so I was going to introduce Lex. Um, so I'll give you the, the official version first. Um, Lex is, Lex, uh, Professor Lex Paulson is a uh, native of Washington, DC. He uh, worked uh, as a longtime uh, campaign organizer. Ooh for the uh, Democratic Party. Uh, so he worked on the Obama campaign, campaigns, I think, both of them, yeah. Uh, he also worked for one of our readers, uh, Mayor Pete, or now Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Um, and that was the, 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 the connection that allowed Pete to, uh, to read a wonderful extract from Oxen of the Sun for us. Uh, he has been a teacher at Sciences Po Paris for several years. He's the executive director of the School of Collective Intelligence um, at I've got UM6P in Morocco. That's the... Mohammed the Sixth is the king of Morocco. Uh -huh. so. Okay. As with Victoria in England, many things become named after you if you're the monarch. <laughs> he, he wrote his PhD on Cicero, which is soon to be published in book form by Cambridge University Press. He's the founder of the Citizens Book Club, which started at Shakespeare and Company and continued for many years at Shakespeare and Company, continued in Lex's flat, continued it over Zoom during the pandemic. And we hope to bring it back to the bookstore um, sometime soon. Uh, he has been our stalwart of Bloomsday ever since I've been at the bookstore, which is almost seven years now. Um, he is the most wonderful MC you could uh, you could want for such a day. Uh, every year we have to twist his arm to sing. We might we might have to do that tonight. It's, you'll you'll notice it's very difficult to get Lex uh, to to break into song or even to speak. Um, he's yeah. he's very, very reticent, retiring, very shy. <laughs> um, and if he is looking slightly tired, uh, part of the reason might be that he is the father of Ili Zara, who was born three weeks and three days ago. Uh, and having been in that position relatively recently myself, uh, you have my greatest respect and sympathy. Uh, and uh, I just want to give you a hug. Uh, I also should say that um, when we were plotting how to celebrate Bloomsday, we had so many logistical or how to celebrate the centenary of Ulysses uh, because of COVID, because of building works at the shop, we had so many logistical difficulties in trying to figure out how to celebrate it. And it was in a meeting with Lex and with Sylvia that we came up with the idea of this reading series, uh, that we came up with the idea of the Bloomcast. And it was in a conversation with Lex over the Christmas holidays um, when uh, we were thinking, no, okay, the Bloomcast could be interesting, but we don't just want it to be like two blokes sitting there babbling on. We need somebody else. We need somebody who hasn't read it. We need somebody interested. We need someone exciting. And it was Lex who had the idea. Uh, I, he met Alice briefly at- No, no, I'm uh, gonna tell this part of the story. Okay. Because, <laughs> I don't because, know this story. Well, no, this is, this is why we're saving it. Okay, oh, so- Is that true? 
Oh. So at, at the, the the Christmas, they're like of, my dad. The, 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 the Christmas oh, event, the Christmas, older brothers. The, okay, older brothers. So I, I've been, literally been waiting for this moment to tell Alice <laughs> why dad. Alice was invited to join the Bloomcast. Okay, now you're gonna learn for the first time. This is now. like when I found out about the seed cake. <laughs> um, so um, uh, the Christmas, um, uh, I should say, event. It's, it was a reading with Jeanette Winterson. Who was a great friend of Shakespeare and Company, a great novelist, and um, who? What was? Do you remember the, the book that she was? I mean, that, that she was. Yeah, 12, uh, 12 or thirteen arguments. Was exactly. Twelve fights. Yeah. 12 right. Fights. And 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 she is a very compelling speaker, but with really earthy energy and great and but also great wit. And um, I was sitting about two rows deep in in the in, in the bookshop, and I was just kind of looking to my right. And I've never seen a person give such rapt attention. I, I never met this woman before. She was sitting right directly to my right. And it was as if her face was a tr like a tractor beam, like locked into. And I was and with this beaming, you know, beatific smile. And I said, I don't know who this person is, but I like the energy that I'm that sensing from this person right now. And, you know, about half an hour later, we were all singing upstairs and she was still there. I said, oh, well, she must be someone known to the shop. And, but I still had no idea who she was, no idea what her name was. All I knew was that she was responding to this writer, to this woman speaking with the greatest energy of any person I'd ever seen in an audience at a, at a, at a book reading. And so after that event, I said, Adam, who was that, the, the, the English girl, uh, who was at that event? Do you remember with you know this very beatific smile? Oh, that's Alice. She works at the American Library. And I said, I think something about her I think would be really great for a podcast. Mm -hmm. And we invited her to be in the podcast. <laughs> so there it is. That's the story. But the, the thing is as well, we were looking for a first time reader. And so that was the thing when we when we invited us, like for crossing our fingers that she hadn't read Ulysses. And would we, you have said no if I had? Probably not, but it was, <laughs> it would, we would have had to reconfigure the podcast a little bit. But the the thing that was we hadn't banked on was that you hadn't read Ulysses, so that was perfect. But you had read in everything your own else. Words, pretty much read everything else in <laughs> Irish literature. So you had the kind of you had all of the context, so much of the knowledge, but this kind of Ulysses shaped hole at the center of it, and that was just the sort of the wonderful combination. And uh, yeah, well, the rest is is history. So that's it. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really <laughs> blushing. <laughs> Um, and we don't regret it because talk about the best uh, energy we've ever, I mean, I've ever yeah. experienced in this, in this group of three people. We had such an incredible time. We had such time. a good time. Can I introduce Adam? If you yeah. like. Yeah. Okay, so Adam Biles, uh, native of Bournemouth, as we found out on a couple of occasions, uh, the, the frequenter of several, uh, of several um, goth and, 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 uh, and dance music clubs in London in the 90s and early 2000s. And then also Starbucks. And afterwards. also the Starbucks the morning after. Uh, but more importantly for me, someone who has been at the heart of the, the literary community in, in Paris, as long as I've lived here for, for the last 10 years, Adam and I met probably 2013 or so. Uh, we met because of the literary prize. We were, yeah. we were um, jurors on the Shakespeare Company Literary Prize. And I, what I was immediately struck by was how Adam was at one and the same time, both um, very uh, carefully and, and, and precisely opinionated about, about writing and then also willing to completely throw out his opinion and look at it from a new way. And it was so much fun to get to know Adam um, in this, in the context of, of talking about, about writing. To paraphrase Groucho Marx, if you don't like my opinions, I have others. I have others, exactly. And, and Adam, in addition uh, to being uh, a great reader, is a great writer. He uh, is the author of Grey Cats, of Feeding Time, and of a soon-to-be-named... Well, soon, uh, well, it's already been named. Soon ah. to be published, Beasts of England. Beasts of England uh, is second novel uh, from Galley Baker Press, uh, and currently serving as literary director uh, of Shakespeare and Company. So, Adam Biles. Thank you. Give me a big round of applause, please, esteems. I have wonderful things to say about Adam and Lex, but in the interest of time, um, let's talk about James Joyce. Let's talk about Ulysses. Um, I think what a, a nice way to start would be. Um, so kind of a surprising effect that this has had on you, whether emotional or intellectual, ineluctable. Um, it's quite ineluctable. Um, I, I, so this was my third time reading Ulysses. So let's 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 do a little. I like the Alice kind of uh, yeah, you know, crowdsourcing here. thing. So um, who here tried and failed to read Ulysses the first time you tried to read Ulysses? Okay, who here has read most of the book but has skipped over certain chapters like Proteus and Oxen of the Sun? 
Okay. Who here, after several attempts, finally did manage to get to all uh, all uh, all eighteen chapters of Ulysses? Okay. So um, I was in each of those categories I named, and um, and I, I will say this time around, what was so incredible, we had the chance because we started in September, October, really talking about um, to read not only read Ulysses again uh, and read it in such incredible fashion. Uh, in this open communal uh, way, stimulated by such great readers from all over the world, but also to read some of the companion works. I had read Harry Blamer's The New Bloomsday Book um, and a little bit of the Gifford uh, Bloomsday, uh, James jo uh, Bloomsday Annotated, but I'd never read Frank Budgeons, uh, who was the friend and consular officer and drinking buddy of, of James Joyce. I'd never read his book, which turned out to be a phenomenally funny and interesting book uh, about the literally first person testimony of what Joyce was saying. Uh, and, and then Declan Kybert, who we became our George Martin, as, in, as Adam put it, our, our, our fifth Beatle, he was, he was um, uh, he is a professor at UCD who wrote a book called Ulysses and Us, The Art of Everyday Living. Again, one of the deeply most warm and humane works uh, of any secondary work on, on literature. And so the joy this time was not only reading Ulysses again and getting it a much, a much deeper sense of the book, but um, all of the uh, companion, companion books that, um, while not necessary, I think are a rich, enriching experience. So the answer to the question is, for, for me, it was the role of Nora in James Joyce's life and I never properly appreciated the role of women, not only Nora, who I knew was very important in the book, but Sylvia Beach, who I knew was important in the book, but Margaret Anderson, Jane Heap, who were the publishers of Little Review, um, uh, who took a chance on, on, the, on the first chapters and then got serious trouble with the, with the courts in, in the US for publishing Ulysses. And, um, and Harriet Shaw Weaver, who was his, uh, his patron, who gave him something of the equivalent of a million pounds in today's money, James Joyce, uh, to, to support him over the course of his, of his writing career. So not only were women critical to the creation of Ulysses, but, but the, the story itself comes from this moment where Nora, um, who we get to know through the voice of Molly, in some sense, it's not it's not a direct um, uh, transposition of, of Nora, but um, we we learn how the the freedom that Nora brought, the the un, the uninhibited and self confident and indomitable energy that Nora Barnacle had, um, that freed uh, the Daedalus like young Joyce from his his torment and from his shame and from and we see in portrait of the artist which which i had I, I also looked through again the the hellfire that was that the torment that was put in front of him as a as a as a young student and nora freed him from all that and 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 that was really what moved me so and i i think about it and i'm moved saying it right now to, to not because she wanted to change him because she allowed him to change by understanding him understanding what he needed allowed him to begin a process where he was able to write Dubliners and then Portrait and then Ulysses and then Finnegan's Wake. And Nora, she wasn't, you know, reading every single reference that you know, she, she, I think, copied over Ulysses several times. So she was certainly very involved, but that wasn't the point. It was that she, her gift to Joyce lay at the heart of this story. And that moved me and, and still moves me. Well, I learned today um, on an interview that you did at Hay, some, one of the speakers pointed out that in her letters to him, she wouldn't use punctuation. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Did not know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's this was. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I think this was the stylistic uh, impact that she had was sort of under underrated as well, actually. Um, but to picking up on on this, I think for me the most surprising effect um, was that it had an emotional impact at all. In fact, because I read Ulysses in a sort of flurry in my, I think I was about nineteen or twenty. Uh, it was in my it was second year of university, and I read it at the same time that I was reading a lot of the other sort of so called great books, things like Moby Dick, things like Don Quixote, things like the Brothers Karamazov. And Ulysses left me oddly cold and it stimulated me intellectually, but I was worrying what, you know, I wondered, was wondering what all the fuss was about. And so I was expecting to come to this project to be intellectually stimulated, but not to be emotionally impacted. And I think it was, at the moment when we first meet Leopold Bloom. And suddenly I got a sense of his intense loneliness at the beginning of this book and his isolation in a sense. 
and that he was in a quandary uh, that he essentially knew he was going to be going out today and his wife was going to be welcoming her lover into their house, into their bed. Yeah, yeah. And he was not sure how he was going to react to that. And he had ended up in this kind of impossible puzzle, which essentially he spends a day trying to extricate himself from and trying to come to some understanding of. And for some reason, probably because I was, as we've discussed many times in the podcast, I was much more of a Stephen at the time I first read it and much more of a Leopold at the second time. You still have some Stephen in you, Adam. I I think. think (laughs) But I think Leopold has some Stephen in him, right? We'll just stop you right there (laughs) and say that you might think that you're like Leopold. (laughs) But I I was just so struck by the emotional impact that Leopold's journey in the book had on me and continues to have on me. And rereading this morning and re-listening to the final episode, uh, Sally Rooney reading the closing uh, pages of um, of Molly Bloom's soliloquy. I mean, I cannot, I've probably read that several hundred times and I well up every single time. Every time I read it, every time I hear it read, I mean, there's no, it could be the worst reading anyone has ever done of that part. And I have difficulty not bursting into tears. Why? I don't know. And I think that's part of the part of the wonderful mystery of this book is that it's it's it doesn't, as we discussed in the last Bloomcast, it doesn't close anything down. It opens things out. And I have still not come to terms with this book and I still don't understand why. And that's why um, probably this time next year I'll be coming towards the end of my fourth reading of it. Do you cry? Absolutely. Why? I mean. <sighs> there's so many there's so many of our fellow human beings who live in pain all day long um and and the chance for some kind of grace some kind of liberation Stephen is in pain all day on june 16th he's in pain his mother has died thinking that he has disappointed her refused to pray for her and he carries the pain of, of being told he would go to hell, of seeing his family slipping into poverty, of knowing that he should do something about that. And he just got paid for his, you know, for his teaching. He doesn't give money to his sister, Dilly. And he hates himself, the agonbite of Inuit. He hates himself for not being a better big brother. I mean, he's the oldest of the, of the family. And, and you see in Stephen, the layers of pain, of trauma, and then to see it also in, held in a different way in Bloom, who carries around not only the embarrassment of, of knowing that her wife is sleeping with another man in their bed that day, um, but thinking about his lost child and having now an infant sitting at home right now in the Third Allen Small, Small, um, I, I, it's, it's, unfathomable the amount of pain that it would cause me if, if a, a, child's, a child's death. And so Joyce grapples with the, 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 the most profound depths of the human experience and, and yet finds ways for both Stephen and, and Bloom to achieve a kind of connection that was not available to them in, the, in 8 a.m. June 16th, but that we see a step towards a kind of a healing, a kind of a reconciliation, not a cure. There's no cures in Ulysses. There's no promise of, of that everything's going to be all right. But there is a step towards something better. There is an appreciation of, of what is joyous and true and beautiful and loving in life. And, and Joyce, you read about James Joyce, he doesn't seem like the most warm and fuzzy guy. <laughs> um, he seems like someone who was very kind of quiet and, and retiring in company. And, and I mean, some people, said he was a wonderful person in, in dinner parties and things, but you don't get the sense of someone who is, is um, who would come and give you a hug, but there is more both sadness and warmth in Ulysses than any book I've ever read. And the fact that Joyce gave that to us and we're still talking about a hundred years later is something that I feel just lucky to know and to read and to be able to read again. Alice. Yeah, um, so, I mean, it's it departs from from, your thoughts, Adam, um, in the sense of, you know, I wonder if you had had this experience when you were in your Stephen phase. <laughs> I, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm, I have no, I have my, of course, my, my family, my parents and my sister, my sister who's apparently going to start reading and listening, <laughs> she said with through, um, you know, um, teeth. <laughs> um, she was, she was like, I don't know if I want to listen to my sister telling me how to read a book. Um, I, I feel very much in the Stephen phase and I, but I feel so happy to have seen the Leopold Bloom side of it now because and that, that this is my secret question to you um but I, I'll, I'll answer next to my secret question to you as well so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer and then I'll ask it back which is that both right I think Stephen um if, if we had a world of Stevens it would be a nightmare and if we had a world of Leopold Blooms it would be a nightmare um I, I think why? why if we had a world of blooms would it be a nightmare because there's something lovely about somebody coming out of a um, of a coma reciting Yeats there's something lovely about someone who is trying to produce art and and is really good at it no and, and I think it would also be hell because I think for Leopold Bloom it would be hell to live in a world populated by Leopold Bloom like, yeah, that's true yeah. that's a very good point um so so basically to have to have this access to another way of thinking, and it, it's it's there are kind of several layers to it really. There's there's res, there's having this conversation, um, this ongoing conversation with Adam and Lex about the the importance of Leopold Bloom in our society, um, and so having that kind of intellectual experience, and then as so much of this book, that intellectual experience seeps out into the world, and I was walking to work, coming here two weeks ago, and I saw a man across the other side of the street walking along, kind of old man wearing a hat early in the morning. And there's a weed, you'll love this. There's a weed growing between some cracks on the pavement. And he stops and he picks up the weed and then he keeps going. You know, the idea that there are people in this world who are not stuck in their heads thinking about their, the impossible characters in their chapter um, or the fact that they didn't get, you know, whatever publishing deal they wanted to get, or so on, so on. Um, and by the way, I think the world rewards and is slanted towards Stephen, especially our world, the world of, of readers and, and thinkers. You know, we're rewarded for being like Stephen. The educational system is, is slanted towards Stephen, certainly the college system. Um, we have several alumna, alumna, all girls, or women of um, Columbia University here. Uh, Columbia University is famous for its great books, now called Literature Humanities program, which is essentially like, you know, this on steroids. Um, and you can see it two ways. And for a long time, basically until I read this book, I saw it the first way, which is, I know all the references. I've read Plato, I've read Aristotle. I've read a bit, you know, I haven't read all of them. I don't know if you read all of them. <laughs> didn't have time. You read a bunch of Shakespeare too. I read a bunch of, you know, I, I, I take all the boxes and I can talk about them and I feel really proud of myself and that's great. Um, have I ever picked up a weed from the pavement? No, I haven't. Um, this is the first book that really challenged that, 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 that bias that I have towards the intellect and towards intellectualism because my experience of reading all of your correspondences on Zoom in person or if you listen to this, um, playback, all of these people around the world who uh, have been intimidated by the Stevens of the world and by what Stephen represents. And uh, it's not for people like Steve. Knowledge is to be shared. Art is to be shared. Um, and anything that someone can do, anything that somebody like Leopold Bloom can do to open that up is really, really, really important. Um, and it's had, it's had an enormous effect. <laughs> Shall we move on to the next question? Um, well, I mean, the next question in our list was, has it changed your life? But I think we've probably already... <laughs> well, I, can, can I add what... Yeah, yeah I mean, I think I think I was thinking, I, I'll, I'll reel them off quickly, but more than other books, this book, because it, to, to the point that um, uh, 
Hastings makes well. Patrick has ah. had. To, we have ah. one of our scholars amongst. Well, he just these. run away. He had to go to. He had to Dublin. go and catch a plane back well. to Dublin. He came over specifically. Okay. The recently in our Blue presence. Patrick the recently Hastings. in our. That's kind of cool that he's now not there. <laughs> it's almost like he's he's evaporated. Like, it's the usual <laughs> just, suspects. Yeah. And like that, <sighs> he's gone. Patrick <laughs> Hastings makes this point. He makes this point, right? That it trains you how to read. This. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So this thinking about reading not as an, again not as an intellectual experience, but as a sensory embodied. Um, experience and 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 cultivating and sharpening habits of mind. Um, so how has it changed my life? Because how has it changed? You know, it sounds ridiculous. Um, but you know, stop watching, start listening. That's the message of the third episode. Mm -hmm. Closing your eyes, just listening to the world. Um, shut your eyes and see. Uh, one eyedness, two eyedness. Trying to see the full picture. Um, whether that's in the in the Cyclops episode. Um, or whether that's with Gertie McDowell. That, I think the Gertie McDowell episode had a huge impact in terms of this idea of seeing someone from afar um, ooh, in a 2D versus interacting with someone in a 3D way, especially thinking about social media and screens. Um, yeah. What about you? How has it changed your life? It's changed your, I imagine, work life, professional well, life. Well, yeah. I, I think, I think <laughs> social that, life. That's one thing I was going to dwell on was the um, the experience of actually producing this podcast and discussing the book in this way with you two and with all of our correspondents. Um, I'm not a particularly social reader. I The idea of book clubs is something which I, I sort of it's, I'm quite allergic to like the for me a book is a very intimate very personal experience it's my communion with the mind of the writer and any kind of pollution to that was something which before this experience I would have been quite resistant to um Ulysses of course it can be read alone of course it can be read without any of the guides without a reading group but the richness of the experience that I have had over the past uh, six months, not only re receiving the recordings, listening to the recordings from people from all over the world in so many different accents, giving their interpretation and in a sort of slight indirect way, their understanding of the book has transformed the, wor the words on the page for me. Each, each time I've come to it, each of the hundred episodes has in some way reconfigured my appreciation do, of do you have an example um i mean it's an example i've talked about before which it was aishan hutchinson so very early on the jamaican poet who was our first reading reader of proteus Sorry. yeah um aishan is uh yeah he's a jamaican poet extraordinary poet and seeing him take the rhythms of joyce's irish english and transposing those into his Jamaican rhythms and making it work and making it something new. And similarly, for example, Keris Matthews, the musician and broadcaster who is a very proud uh, Welsh person and has an extraordinarily strong Welsh accent and is enormous admirer of Dylan Thomas. And hearing her read an extract from Sirens in a broad Welsh accent was just transformative for me. And it made me realize actually how much Dylan Thomas was influenced by Joyce as well. And seeing the ripples of um, that this book had on the, on the literary world. But also beyond that, the discussion with, with you two, um, I think there, I don't, I, I don't think there was competitivity is not the word, but I think all of us from very early on realized, okay, we've got to raise our games <laughs> like we we all came to it with such enthusiasm and with kind of with with such with such sort of background work as well that i don't know if you two felt this but i was certainly like okay i'm gonna have to make sure i'm prepared because if i'm going to talk with alice and lex about this and not sound like a complete fool then i'm gonna have to read this book much 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 more closer more closely than i anticipated so alice did were you also you, surprised when we would walk in and adam would be like i haven't prepared anything and then he would take out his full like his full introduction two pages of solid text you know they were like word for he had like he had meticulously planned and i was like oh this is a rather prepared unprepared person <laughs> although my, my approach to things is it's my approach to a lot of things is sort of prepare intensely and then put it aside right like i, I don't know if you noticed but i very rarely referred to my notes during the recordings. It makes me think that there's a moment in 
this wonderful film called uh, uh, Hearts of Darkness, which is a making of Apocalypse Now. Oh, right. Uh, it's a wonderful film. And you have, um, so Coppola is freaking out because you know, everything is going wrong in the production of this film. And he's talking about the different things, the you know, problems with the, the various military planes and you know, the weather and all of this stuff. And then he says, and of course, you know, Dennis doesn't know his lines, talking about Dennis Hopper, who spent most of the recording off his face on LSD. And Dennis Hopper what, hears this in the background. He wanders over. He says, oh, Francis, man, you told us we could forget the script, forget the lines. And Coppola turns to him and says, yeah, first you learn the lines, <laughs> then, you, <laughs> then you forget the lines. <laughs> and that was the way I approached these, this blue cast, like prepare, 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 and then, and then set it aside yeah. and see, see where the conversation took us. And I think that was when the conversations really took flight actually were the moments where we had our plan, but then we diverged from the plan in ways that we, uh, we hadn't expected. I think this was such a great question. I hope you have, I have answers to this question. Go for it. Um, which line from the book would you like tattooed on your forearm? Did you think about this? Did you have time to prepare? Which you, line? you wrote it. I, I've got I've got three possibilities. Okay. Um, depending not on that what, they're prepared. Depending on what <laughs> mood I'm in. Uh, love loves to love. Um, maybe it's a little bit a little bit obvious. Um, history and then I remove. Stephen said is a dream from which I'm desperate to awaken. I'm going to misquote it now. Uh, history is a dream. A nightmare from a which night I'm from, trying to awake. History is a, a, nightmare, a nightmare from which, from which I'm, I'm trying, trying to awake. awake. Uh, and then, of course, and now I'm going to, you know, it's been it's been a long day, but the um, the line about genius making no mistakes. The errors of a genius are volitional. They are the portals of his discovery. You can always rely on Lex to have the quotes to hand. It's incredible, this man's mind. <laughs> what would you get? I mean, portals of his discovery is a good one. I also I have to say I was I was reading the last page, two pages of of Molly's soliloquy again and again and again. And the. The, the line, the sun shines for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, could, I, I just, and it's so, I read it slow, as slow as I could possibly read it, and it still feels too fast. The sun shines for you, and you are the flower of the mountain. And I just, I well up every time. Mm -hmm. So something like the, the sun shines yeah. for you. Alice? Well, I just, just I wanted to um, jump off this thing of slowing down, just to say one more thing about um, how does it change our life or experience of it, which is that, um, it, this is connected to the kind of flatness and 2D-ness of, of social media and screens, I think. But I just feel, and we don't feel this so much in Paris. Um, and of course, you have to move a little bit with the flow of life or, or the pace of life. But life is moving so quickly these days, um, and it, 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 it's driven. It's driven by. It's driven by the algorithms. <laughs> I mean, it sounds kind of. Um, like a conspiracy theorist, but no, you sound like the voice of your generation, which is what we <laughs> yeah. Well, the, you I the think the, the voice of my generation is actually really realizing how um, detrimental some of these tools um, are, yeah. and and we didn't know it, and we kind of, especially people. So I'm 25, so I guess mid 20s, early 20s, a bit late 20s. You know, we're really realizing that we really don't want this. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. uh, that it hasn't been good for our childhoods that it is not good um, for children. Uh, and it's actually my generation that's pushing back, I think, and leading the charge against, you know, if I look at my parents' generation, a lot of them are really, really unconsciously addicted to, to these things because they are designed to be addictive. This whole experience of reading slowly, of coming in once every two weeks, of reading all the companion texts, it was like, slow roast mm. yeah slow reading and this is a point that Declan Kybert makes about sort of this because because actually the fears you just expressed about those things moving so quickly and you know not being able to stop and slow down these were fears that people had in the time they, always, Joyce was they writing. always have them and Kybert talks about how in the construction of his sentences Joyce forces you to slow down yeah. so there is sort of bulb the, and blub yeah bulb and blub so you could sort of you don't it's not exactly that you catch on the words but something in your brain is forced to kind of pass yeah. the difference between yeah. the words and to just slow down, to take your time with the yeah. sentences. Yeah. And that's again, Joyce sort of, in a sense, training us and teaching us yeah. to how to read his book. Habits of mind. I mean, it's, it's, it's slow down and then relatedly, and this is the point that Kybert also makes, which I was really moved by in our conversation with him, which is that he's trying to slow things down 
and break people out of their rote thought patterns. Yeah. So <laughs> get those yeah on the recording. Um, uh, that, that he was really, really, and I made this point in the first episode, he was really um, uh, concerned. And if you read Dublin as you see it in the short stories, um, there's so much kind of old speech rattling around in Ireland at this time in Dublin of people just reeling off. I mean, in some ways it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's prayers, it's songs, um, it's old stories. But there, there's a point where the kind of love, the, the story that you've told three times Pause, kind of moves through the threshold into are you having any new ideas mm -hmm. are you having any new yeah. thoughts are you just going to your re you know it's all about these going to your reflexes and not engaging you know the frontal cortex of your brain and so slow down yes but also let's have some new thoughts yeah um but just a question was this digression so you could avoid telling us which no, tattoo you no. were going to get? <laughs> <laughs> so your parents if they're no. listening don't worry the secret is, gonna... this is why she's wearing long pants she has no more room for tattoos uh, Alice has no more room just up and down Joyce <laughs> Dublin is on the left leg uh portrait of the artist on the right it's just gonna be Finnegan's wake around the neck that's the last, that's the last bit okay I have two um actually the first one is related to what I was just saying which is you know sometimes you're reading um, a book and, and something just jumps out at you and you just don't know why. Mm. And um, this was, they're both towards the end. I wanted to pick ones towards the end just to, when I, if I, if I had a tattoo, just to, to remind myself that I did in fact get to page 280 <laughs> of any book. As I, it's also, it's like, I, I've, 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 you know, I don't know if you've had this experience now, any book, you know, give me any book and I'll read it. And I'll read it really quickly <laughs> after reading this book. Um, it's like, I'm ready for Bring anything. it on, Dostoevsky. Bring it on, Dostoevsky. <laughs> um, so the, the first one is uh, an opening was all uh, was wanted. So this is in uh, Ithaca, I think, mm -hmm. um, because it's kind of related to what Lex was saying about how Nora really opened up Joyce uh, for him, for kind of opened up his artistic spirit. But I think it, and I flagged it in our, in our noticeables in that episode. Um, I think it prefigures Penelope. And I think it prefigures the kind of movement of literature in the 20th century because it, it's, he's, you know, and, and this is to Adam's point saying, it just opens, it opens up, this book opens everything up, doesn't close anything down. And, the, and Joyce gets this. And, and so an opening was always wanted, just this idea of, of creating space for the new and letting go of the past and breaking, breaking things open. And in order to create space, there needs to be some 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 brokenness. Um, so that's one. And then the other one um, is, did it flow? Which is the question um, that the water about the water, yes. in part because I love the formal uh, features of that episode. Can we just thank Fuad, who's back back there, who read the the water the water passage from Ithaca? You did such a great job. And and it was yeah it was one of our favorite passages from the book wasn't yeah. it yeah and the only passage that includes by the way the what did Bloom water lover water carrier yeah. think about water is the only we talked about democracy every single episode because I'm such a pedant about <laughs> democracy every single episode and and it's the only place where the word democracy appears mm -hmm. in the yeah. entire work of Ulysses it's democratic why he's talking about water what he likes about water is its democratic equality right it always finds its own level. And so Fudd did a great job, so thank yeah, you for that. Yeah, yeah. And it should also be pointed out that Fudd also wrote an academic paper essentially responding to the Bloom cards, particularly on the subject of non-Euclidean geometry, which uh, if there's some way we can uh, we can get that out there. Uh, I actually, I, the I, convergence I pulled of it. parallel lines. I pulled it. Can I read it? Because I thought it was so funny. You can read the entire paper. No, I just read a little okay. bit. A little bit. <laughs> Page one. Okay, Fudd, associate <laughs> professor. This is all right, yeah? Associate professor, California State University, Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, and at the top of the email, he quotes you like um, like some sort of sage, like, some, like <laughs> someone. We like digressions. Are you guys following that on? <laughs> okay, so at the top of the email, Fard wrote, quoting Adam, <laughs> the thing. Why about... is that so ridiculous? <laughs> No, not even quite exciting. No, because it's <laughs> academic it's so, citation. It's so academic. It's like the quote, and it's like Adam Biles, comma, Bloomcast, episode eight. <laughs> Get used to it. We're getting, we're, we're going into the canon. So the, the quote is, <laughs> it's just a funny quote. The thing about walking on parallel lines is that they never intersect. 
Mm -hmm. That's your quote. That's my quote. Do you stand by your quote? <laughs> I do. The well, thing about walking on parallel lines. Because is I live in a Euclidean world, I've just discovered. But this is profound. No, this is profound, right? Because no, this is absolutely profound. I really... was right. Adam, as always, he says things that are more intelligent than he even realizes, I think, at the time. <laughs> because think about, and I, it, those of us who, who, have, who have had to you know, dabble in different parts of Joyce, the dead, right? And I, I, I just, um, my, my mom actually who's here. Mom, are you here? Here's with my mom. My mom encouraged me to, to reread the dead and we're gonna watch the movie, the uh, Johnny. Can I give a little round of applause for my mom? Just a little, <laughs> my mother who raised me to be a great, a great and passionate reader because she is a great and passionate reader. Thank you, mom. Um, uh, the dead, uh, the, ca the, ca the characters of, of Gabriel Conroy and Greta Conroy, the two again, phenomenally rich characters. And they are two parallel lines also. Right. And and the, the both the sweetness and the sadness of, of that last uh, passage in, in the dead with the snow falling on living in the dead is because he's lying in bed with his wife. He has failed to connect with her in the way that he wanted to, but he's connected with her in another way, in another almost metaphysical dimension. And like we had this kind of debate, did Stephen and Bloom connect? The debates we've been having for a hundred years. Do is Joyce playing a joke, saying that oh, you expected this happy ending of Stephen to stay over at Bloom's house and and to you know give Molly Italian lessons and 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 is this a thwarted expectation or do the lines intersect? And so now we have a non-Euclidean uh, geometer. I, I, I have the rest of it because it's equally brilliant. So he says so he, that's the beginning of the email. The quote: Adam Bell's Bloom Cross episode eight. Adam, being a person of genius offered the relevant porthole of discovery when he noted that, quote, the thing about walking on parallel lines is that they never intersect. For this is only true in Euclidean ge geometry, but I'd like to suggest Joyce is inviting us to, to consider non-Euclidean geometry wherein parallel lines yeah. can intersect. And that, and that is one of the most fascinating things about Fred's paper is that, um, of course, because the action takes place in 1904, which is pre-Einstein. And yet Joyce was writing. Well, he was just writing his papers in Bern mm. at that point, right? He had just written 1905, 1905. Mm. So it was right around the time yeah. that Einstein was coming up with the- But Joyce would have been writing at a time when these theories were- not were, yet public, yeah, yeah. Were becoming public and becoming incredibly famous and transforming people's interpretation of it. So, so there could be no reference to it because it would have been an anachronism. And yet in some way, uh, yeah, Freud makes a very uh, persuasive argument that Joyce was incorporating these ideas into his work. Fantastic. Um, more questions? Okay. More questions, let's see. Um, okay, so I guess one, this is really, I I'll pick up on, or should we do the surprise questions? Yeah, sure. yeah. I like the question if you had to live in one of the yeah, episodes yeah, yeah, for that's eternity, where I was gonna, which where would I was it be? Go. So Adam, if you had to live in one of the episodes of Ulysses for the rest of your life, which would it be and why? Um, it's not, it's, it's a part of an episode. Um, which is the Again, no planning here. <laughs> which, is, which is Leopold Bloom in the Turkish baths, just at the conclusion yeah. of sorry, my mind's leaving me of which episode? Of Lotus Eaters. Of Lotus Eaters, and just the moment where he is in the bath and he is uh, sort of admiring the sort of the cloud of his pubic hair sort of rising up to the surface of the water, but just this moment of peace and tranquility and some sort of sense of calm in an otherwise uncalm day for Leopold Bloom is an incredibly powerful moment for me and so yeah I would be I would be there at that moment uh, admiring my pubic hair. Alice? <laughs> how, how to follow do you have one? Oh yeah sure yeah go. Do you want me to go I'll go next okay so so I'm going to do an extremely unpopular episode of Ulysses which is Eumaeus and we and because of the reason we talked oh, yeah. about yeah, yeah. I love that feeling right of, of being in this kind of cramped, but kind of intimate, a little bit drunk, a little bit worse for wear, but then sorting out, right, the problems of the world. Mm -hmm. And, but what I wanna be the fraternity, no. So let's put that aside. So you may as, you know, <laughs> briefly considered and then rejected, but Ithaca, I mean, what better moment is there than pouring the cocoa and then walking outside with the ash plant and the candle and encountering the heaven tree of stars hung with humid night blue fruit. That's where I want to be for. I mean, that is eternity. That's where I want to be for eternity. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say yes. That's all sounds lovely, but <laughs> unless you just want to be gazing at stars <laughs> or sitting in the bath, I mean, you have to live in this world. You can't just sit in the bath for eternity. Try having a small child, <laughs> <laughs> lying in a warm bath, alone. 
would do nicely. Okay, so again, yeah, I guess ask me this question in whenever I have a child years. Um, my answer would be precisely to the point about um, parallel lines, because I think uh, this is again, um, really a kind of pressing issue for us today, which is we're all living in our own worlds because of um, the way that we interact with the world through our phones and also um, the way that the world is kind of designed to just buffer us from interacting with, with other people. So just in America, it's so much worse in America because public space, um, which is, you know, we talked a lot about in the podcast, public space is, is, is basically non-existent. I mean, I was in New York um, and I just thought, well, you know, I, there are two kind of main public spaces. I use, I use libraries and I use swimming pools. And I tried to find both of those things and it was impossible. Mm. It's totally impossible. Whereas yeah. in Paris, you type in, you type in library to the uh, to Google or to whatever search engine you use, um, and it offers you loads. And you can sign up for free. You can sign up for 10 euros a year. Uh, you can go that day. You can be surrounded by other people who are um, And they're kind, this. they're nice, they, they'll, they, and welcome you to these beautiful 17th century spaces. Same with swimming pools. Um, so for me, um, the answer would be wandering rocks. Because I was so, again, formally moved by what Joyce is trying to do in that episode, which is how to have people's different realities intersect, how to, how to create the sense of interconnectivity, interconnectivity, interconnectedness um, on the page. And that's what I was moved again and again by in this book, just, and not, he doesn't always pull it off, but he's trying to push the limits um, of language to 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 portray what he what his interests are, which is rendering sounds and images on the page, um, which is expressing the interconnectivity of of humankind, which is expressing li literal music on the page. Um, so I would like to be wandering rocks, um, although with a slight um, note at the end, which is I would like to be intersecting with different people, but not. Or like have a little bit of time on my own <laughs> and then have kind of the interpolations come at certainly surprising moments because I think um, going maybe back again to democracy but just to a healthy future a healthy future is not one where everyone is on their parallel line a healthy future is one where lines are crossing all the time and that happens in public spaces and it happens in, in wandering rocks so Declan Kybert has a great, the great uh, insight um, in our in our podcast interview that what is democracy if not us learning from each other, mm -hmm. right? And each of us bringing our intelligence, our um, our experience, our talents um, into the public space. Yeah, I'd like to bring up the question um, about which section made you laugh the most, um, because one of the things I've heard most from people who are encountering encountering Ulysses for the first time. It's just how surprised they are at how funny this book is, uh, how surprised they are at how dirty it is, how surprised they are at how sort of how wild it is. Um, and this is something I hope we really got across during these Bloomcasts was just the fun available in this book. Uh, and I'm gonna just gonna give my answer quickly before throwing it to you guys. For me, and this is for very particular reasons, and our listeners will, um, will I probably uh, understand this, um, the Circe chapter. Um, the rest of the book we recorded with people were sent an extract, they read their extract, they sent it in. This is impossible for Cersei. This is an unperformable play. So you're not going to send somebody a few pages in which they have to do like 40 different voices. That doesn't make sense. So again, Mr. Lex Polson had the idea that, well, why don't we just get a bunch of amateurs together in the upstairs reading library of Shakespeare and Company and try and record this. Um, it took a while to plan because of various kind of COVID uh, interruptions, but in the end, we took two Thursdays in May to record this episode, two Thursday mornings, uh, with Lex acting as our narrator, with some of my wonderful colleagues from the bookstore, uh, people like Ben, people like Octavia, people like Anne, people like Amy, um, and then other friends. There was Kate, there was Francesca, um, there was Heather, um, there was Connor, uh, our colleague from the cafe. Um, and these were two four hour sessions where I, I just can't remember laughing so much uh, in recent years, particularly with COVID for such sustained periods. I mean, partly because of the episode, but partly just the 
foolhardiness. The sheer absurdity. The absurdity of trying to do this. It's like, well, Lex is dishing out the party. Okay, so Heather, you're going to play the bar of soap and you're going to play the bed quotes. And you're going to be cunty Kate. Yes. Yeah, for example. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, you know I, I would do a line of, because uh, I didn't originally want to participate, but we were we didn't have enough men. So it's like, okay, I'm going to do some Stephen Dedalus. And Lex said, no, no, you have to be drunker than this, Adam. You do that line again <laughs> and you really get drunk. And so, and it was freeing and it was such an extraordinary experience and if anyone has listened to those um i think it comes across in the recordings uh, what also comes across in the recordings is how technically difficult it is to record a group, uh, people. A group of people uh, in, a, in a small book lined room and to get it to sound good and i think we just about managed it but wow the you know joyce gave us the material to work with but just i want to pay tribute to my my fellow readers because we we had a blast should we get some secret questions? Yeah, and then let's turn it over. Okay, so my secret question is, so we're about to ask each other questions that we have not told the others we were going to ask. Um, so my secret question for you, Alice, is um, you have been uh, all throughout this podcast, the, the clarion voice of the here and now. So uh, you can bring any character from Ulysses here now. Who do you bring? Where do you go? What will you do with them? No preparation. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, I kind of already said it in the previous in the previous podcast, but I think, and I don't remember his name because it's it's like five names. The guy who falls into the vat. Cashel, Tisdale, O'Doyle, Fitzmaurice, Farrell, something like this. Uh, it's it's a bit dark, but again, I I really think this book. Um, uh, is alerting us to the ills. You know, you're saying so many people spend all day suffering, um, you know, suffering, not even neutral, not even happy, not even reading literature. Um, this, uh, this, this really, really struck me when I read, when I encountered this character, because it, it, it's really easily missed. This is somebody who fell into a vat in his workplace um, of... Brewery, Guinness, right? Of Guinness, yeah. Um, that is abhorrent. <laughs> that there are workplaces like that. Uh, there were in the 20th century, early 20th century, there are today. Um, and I think Joyce is saying, you know, because I think it's it's around the Aeolus episode, which is the episode where they're in the newspaper offices. And so that kind of um, juxtaposition of on the one hand, people working with words, and then here we have somebody who not only is a manual laborer, but has physically, like so many manual laborers, suffered for the work that he does with no kind of social security safety net. So I would bring him here and I would, I'd like to hear more about how that happened and, um, and how to change it. So. Beautiful answer. Oh, okay. Do I get a secret question? Yeah, yeah. To Adam. Okay, well okay. this, we kind of talked about it, but since um, uh, it is it, related to the, to the Leopold and Stephen, mm -hmm. because you say, you now identify so strongly with Bob Bloom. That's been kind of your one of your main points. Yeah. Um, wh what can we rectify in Stephen? I guess we hadn't really fully answered it at the beginning. What can we rectify? In as in, what do we what do we keep from Stephen as we move into the Leopold Bloom phase of life? Um, I mean, I don't want to come across as sounding kind of down on Stephen. I think Stephen is exactly where he needs to be at that time in his life. Um, and I really, really, really wish him well. I wish I because he is, as, as Lex said earlier, he is in such a dark place. And I think he, he, he is he is uh, a man. He is an adult. And yet he is still, I think, kind of anchored to a, uh, in a in a certain sense, a kind of childlike apprehension of the world, which I think artists need to preserve at least some of to to exercise their craft um but it can be if that part of you if you cling on to that the part of it sort of for too long and too hard then i think the older you get and the years go on and the more the years go on the more destructive it can be for you and for those around you so in a sense what i want for stephen is not so much that he become more like Leopold Bloom, because I think he is an artist in a way that Leopold Bloom isn't. But I hope that in this 
contact or near contact with Leopold Bloom, something of Bloom's groundedness, something of his compassion rubs off on Stephen and allows Stephen to just achieve a little bit more psychological balance. Mm. How about you ask me and then I'll send it back around the circle. So as I said in the introduction, Lex, um, you are a father of a three week, three day old little girl. Um, one of the things I enjoyed most in the recording of these Bloomcasts was your uh, apparent hope that you would, well, after she was born, you'd be able to plan things <laughs> and continue doing things in your life, which uh, in, in a similar way to what which you could do before. And uh, I mean, the fact that you are here and the fact that you were so present on Bloomsday when she was less than a month old, I felt remarkable, remarkable about you and also remarkable about it's your It's my wife. wife that's remarkable <laughs> for allowing me to be here all day. But what I'm really interested in is that this came so, her birth came so late uh, in this reading of Ulysses, this experience of the book. I know when my daughter was born, sort of it was like something cracked open. My, my apprehension of the world transformed so profoundly. And I'm just curious to hear you reflect on if the, her, her birth three weeks and three days ago has shifted in some way your appreciation and apprehension of Ulysses. Has it, has it reconfigured your world to, on every level in that way? And in what way has it reconfigured your understanding of the book? So two, two ways, I think. Two ways come, come to mind right away. So the first is this book, we, we encounter ideas, whether it's about reducing cruelty to animals, um, being vegetarian, reducing nationalism, the role of nationalism in war in, in human society, um, taking away the idea of sexual possessiveness from a married couple, um, universal basic income, <laughs> public transportation, public health, sanitation, where, as we said, these are ideas that still haven't come to pass in France or anywhere. It might take another hundred years for the ideas in Joyce's book for us to be able to listen and learn of what it would take to make a happier, more loving, more caring, more kind and curious world. And I think about my daughter, will she have the chance to see um, some of these ideas that Bloom stands for uh, come to pass that I haven't yet been able to see? So that's the first. And, and the second is um, just a week or so after she was born, I had uh, one of my dear friends from, from DC growing up who I was, a, I was a best friends with in fourth grade, and, a, and a, because we were both very bookish nerds, my mom remembers Chris Christabian, who um, has since become um, a, an incredible um, leader within the UNICEF, in the UN and UNICEF system. He founded the UNICEF um, Innovation Lab um, Network, and um, he is still a great reader, and he has a young daughter who is now about a year old. And we were, I was walking around the Marais and he was telling me about what it was like when she was, when she was just a few weeks, a few months old. And he said, you know, and he had no idea what I've been doing for the last six months. We talk, you know, every so often. He said, you know what I read to her when she was very young? And I said, no. And he said, I just started reading Finnegan's Wake. I started reading Finnegan's Wake. And, you know, I just would read a page or two, you know, every time that she was a little sleepy, I would read, I would read Finnegan's Wake and I got about 150 pages in and then, and then, you know, moved on to something else. And, and it was profound for me, not only because he had no idea that I was in this Joycean kind of obsessive you know, period, um, but that it reminded me about the sound of language, the pure sound of Joyce and how Joyce was so in tune himself about words as, as beings. And, um, and I think about that now, my daughter has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> All she has is the sound of my voice. And, um, and that's all she'll have for, I guess, a little while. But that's, that's what I, I think is, is connecting me to this moment is the, the beauty uh, and, the, and the, 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 the very fine-tuned awareness of the sound of language for, for Joyce 
and that's i guess how babies maybe see the world too or, or if you hear another language i mean i was struck by that when you got hungry on the phone today. oh yes we had so it was a great part of our afternoon today was that we got uh Sombateli, the 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 hometown of leopold bloom's father um they celebrate bloom's day every year and have a, a joycey and kind of community that that centers you know central europe they go to hungary and they go to sambateli and i happened to meet in budapest i was doing a democracy workshop and i happened to meet a woman who worked for the town and i said ah isn't that the town from you said, oh yes we have a bloomsday celebration so i arranged to get them on the phone that was really fun we got to hear uh the first page um uh of of the book read in hungarian it was lovely. so that's totally that experience yeah I think we have time for one more surprise question and then we'll open because we do want to hear from some of you. So, Can I ask you mine? Sure. Okay. So Adam is a study political philosophy, Ring huh. of Gyges, book one of Plato's Republic. So the idea is that you get put a ring on and you get to go and steal stuff and no one, no one will know, be the wiser. So you get to put on this ring, go back and steal something writerly, a technique Oh my God. A moment of Ulysses and no one will ever know. And you get to take it as yours from James Joyce and put it in your next novel. What do you take? Hmm. It's an interesting one to answer just because one thing that I realized when rereading it now was that I'd done quite a bit of that already. <laughs> sort of inadvertently. Um, so that completely. Um, yeah, like so. So, for example, the, one of the things in Feeding Time is his use of sort of pulp magazines boys own stories which i realized it may became like several generations removed from joyce but that idea of using low culture um or bringing sort of rather sort of removing the idea of high and low culture and sort of bringing everything into the mix i realized suddenly when reading this that it was yeah that it was from joyce um i suppose it's not so much a technique but a, an approach and I'm very conscious when saying this, that um, Sam Jordison, my editor at Galley Beggar, is most likely either listening live or will be listening to the podcast. But like there's this thing in editing and writing where people say, kill your darlings. And Joyce did the absolute opposite of that. He, he indulged and massaged and flirted he with his thrones darlings. for his darlings. He did. And I think probably it's a good piece of advice unless you are of a, a level of genius to, to match Joyce. But there is something so rewarding from a writing perspective to read a book in which a writer takes an idea and runs and runs and runs and runs with it. That, um, yeah, if I could take, a, I suppose, a little bit of Joyce's, Joyce's courage, that would, be, um, that would be what I'd take. Thank you so much. Can we have a big round of applause, please, for Lex, Adam, and for all being here. So we're, we're going to open it up to your questions and comments. So Margot and Victorine have lovely baskets. If you have a question or a comment, um, do put it in there and we'll try and get to them. And to kick off this, this um, crowdsourced part of, of, the, of the event, um, we have a very, very special uh, guest with us. Um, so Sylvia Beach in 1953 uh, bestowed Sylvia will Sylvia Whitman will correct me if I, if I get this wrong um, uh, carried you know carried on bestowed the legacy of the original Shakespeare and company to George Whitman and a dear friend of George Whitman's is with us and has written a poem in honor of Bloomsday 2022 uh, Penn Mellis and so will you do us the honor of reading this poem at this event Anything but my brain. Um, it's for George. Uh, the poem is for George. George Whitman, who is a big Good friend of mine. And uh, voila. <laughs> well. In George Whitman lives Merlin, whose magic art outlasts all modes, works wonders in hearts, yearning, longing for spice of life which only wizened wizards grow. No one truly knows or catches this nomad's heart, for it dwells in the well's deep crystal spring, where mermaids, angels, dreams bring his sprightly spirit silver gifts. 
pans pipes play plaintive tunes, calls this Pied Piper's pilgrim soul to follow the sun's golden bowl, filled with the fruit of people's praise for his shadow, unique, a bookshop full of impish nymphs in a house at the feet of Our Lady, where kings and queens walk and whisper their ancient secrets in streets paved with history. Myth, myth and legend lend their folklore as muse of Shakespeare's fame, created by a man's great mind, above and beyond the real, a fabulous tale of love. <laughs> and the wonderful thing is as well so much of that could have equally applied to james joyce and ulysses there's this kind of coming together in themes of spirit thank you so much sure. <laughs> thank you yes we should it's worth noting i'm sure there have been many on zoom um some in person we receive so many do you want to take one um or two so many emails um adam you agree to this i guess implicitly we're gonna we're gonna do another episode do you want to explain yeah in a few weeks time we received so many interesting emails um with questions and things that we would like to respond to um from our listeners so hopefully uh, some of them are listening live or listening to uh, to the playback of this on, on our podcast uh, so we're going to record in a few weeks time once we've all regathered our forces uh, an extra episode of bloomcast in which we respond specifically to a lot of the questions and the emails because um when we asked you to write in i think we were anticipating a, you know a trickle of short emails a respectable trickle yes and what we actually received was a deluge of incredibly detailed incredibly well thought out incredibly passionate reflections and questions so we're going to take a little pause and then in a few weeks or a month or so um, we're going to come back together and we're going to record a special episode uh, responding to your to the correspondence that correspondence and maybe I should say any that comes in <laughs> after after this episode. Well this 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 uh, is very relevant to the question that that um, someone wrote when will you launch season two might I suggest in search of lost time Proustcast um adam adam just like jumps know, out adam the is, window because he's the one who edits the can, we, can we get him an intern if we get him an intern no but this is actually a really a really apt suggestion because of the incredible mystique around the legendary meeting of marcel proust and james joyce mm. and it was it also happened Answer the question nearly <laughs> nearly 100 years ago it was may may 1922 where proust and joyce famously sat next to each other at a dinner party and there are three or four totally divergent uh, accounts of what happened um, uh, between uh, Joyce and Proust, but they were residents of Paris and the two, you know, two of the greatest literary geniuses of the century. That's all I'm going to say about that because I see Adam uh, cautioning me with his <laughs> eyes. No, I mean, my, well, I mean, firstly, you know, you guys just had to show up. I had to record <laughs> That's the, true. the bloody things. And I, you know, this if there not... was a pie chart for the <laughs> amount of work done to make sure this podcast happened, um, he would have most of the pie. I think also, um, and this is my kind of, uh, I guess, slightly sort of romantic side, is that I have had so much fun over these 10 episodes. A part of me will be afraid to take on anything else because the magic <laughs> that I have felt, oh, it's true. I'd be worried about, you know, the three of us getting in a room, so actually this book whichever book we might decide on we I, i'd be worried about not being able to recreate that particular energy that we found so serendipitously around james joyce's ulysses i think you know i was speaking to david uh who's here from from shakespeare and company <laughs> and sylvia hello so these sylvia and david run shakespeare and company bookshop um they're in the audience this evening and so many of you probably came from their celebrations we were talking um about yeah, what other book? Not not specifically like what would we do, but what could one do? Uh, and obvious names come to mind, right? So Brothers Karamazov, um, maybe Dick. Dick, 
um, Don Quixote. Don Quixote. Then you get into translation. David was saying, well, how could we just maybe do a bit of Shakespeare? And it's these are Twist and Shandy. These are all really great suggestions. And then we were, and then we both kind of, I mean, this isn't answering the question, and it's neither saying yes or no, but it is, I think, observing the very specific um, quality of this book, which is at once so capacious, full of uh, references, and also um, so ritualistic. Um, and ritualistic both in the sense of the rituals that it encourages, uh, you know, eating gorgonzola sandwiches, drinking Bringing breakfast to your wife. Bringing breakfast to your wife. Um, and also ritualistic, and this, this gets to a question we had on Zoom from Matt, uh, who's been a loyal listener from, from start to finish. Um, and he's and Matt's is asking about Oxen of the Sun um, and saying, you know, everyone says it's so horrible. I actually had a really great time. What did you guys think? And I was thinking about this today. Um, I've never had the experience of saying to someone, oh, I got to chapter three. And there's a universal kind of experience. We all got to chapter three well, and we all threw our hands exactly. up in the air. Can you tell me another book where there, there are moments where your experiential response is the same? The Proust, it's, it's absolutely the same. You read okay. 60 pages, the first 60 pages of Proust, and you're like, how long is he going to talk about hugging his mother? Right? And it's, I think, I think it, there must be some kind of hidden code between Joyce and Proust about get, get you in and about 20 pages in or 50 pages in, haze them. But no, right? there's no Proust. Is there a Proust day or a Swan's Way day? I mean, oh, no, no. I, oh, yes, you mean in that sense, ritual. No, I, I meant in the sense of the universal experience of meeting people who read up to exactly that point in the book and then gave up. Right, which is which you read people who have gotten up to Proteus and then I can't do Stephen yeah, yeah. on the on the beach. Although it blew my mind in our discussion with Declan Kybert that Oxen of the Sun wasn't Joyce a, a sort of demonstrating his incredible learning of all the different uh, 32, I think is it, literary styles he parodies, but that all of these styles came from a single primer in English literature that he had. And in fact, he just went through and he, there was just 32 chapters and he just did a little bit in the style of the bit in this book. Like, and, and that's, I think, comes back to this idea of sort of the book being accessible to everyone. Like Kybert says, you know, basically he was writing it for somebody who had more or less a high school level of education. You know, this is not a book for the scholars. This is a book for everybody. And there are some things, in a sense, the fact that it has been taken over by the scholars in some ways, it's such a shame and because it puts people off. And I think I hope one of the things that this project and other projects and guides like, for example, Patrick Hastings, who was here for the start of this conversation, do is bring people into the book who were intimidated by it, people who were afraid of it, people said, oh, no, it's going to be too difficult for me. Like, it is going to be difficult, but it's not going to be too difficult for you. I don't think it's too difficult for anybody. Yeah, it belongs to everybody. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I have, is reading Joyce performance art? <laughs> um, now I'm is asking that question performance art. <laughs> I mean, I'm curious about whether reading it to what who asked this question. Hello. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious. I mean, That's there's two question. potential interpretations here, right? So is it sort of do you mean sort of is reading it aloud? Like they give like a hundred readers, or just the, the actual process of reading it? Are you saying like is it like virtue signaling essentially? No, no, okay. That's a great question. I would say, well, my response to that would be if if thinking of it as performance art allows you to read it, <laughs> then yeah, sure, why not? Uh, beyond that, I don't have no, much. I th well, I think how you just explained it, the idea of of gymnastics that that gives a great image, I think, because Joyce does send you into mental gymnastics quite intentionally, right? And and from Telemachus, it's very it's bubbly but very conventional, the style of, of, of Telemachus, Buck Mulligan, Stately Pump Buck Mulligan and the, and the dialogue. Nestor, DZ in the classroom, same. And then once you get to Proteus, it's like, whoop, you're, you're, on, you're doing a somersault. Uh, and then by the time you get to Sirens and now you're encountering like uh, you know, a symphony in prose or a fugue, a contrapuntal fugue, and then Circe, this you know, hallucinatory dream play. So I think, I think Joyce, as, as we talked about with Declan Kybird, was trying to, and as you said about slowing down, was trying to create a, a new kind of reader. And um, he, he enables or encourages a kind of performance happening in your own mind. And you have to complete the book, right? Joyce doesn't write Ithaca, right? Or Nestor in his book. Now, Declan Kybird said, 
this was maybe Joyce's mistake of giving the schema of the 18 chapters to, to, uh, to Stuart Gilbert uh, that then set him off on this, you know, on, on Ulysses becoming this scholarly text as opposed to a text um, for, for everybody. Um, and, you know, I think that there's, there's some truth in that, but I think, I think overall, um, Joyce wants us to be a partner in writing the book. Can I? Yes, you, you said, what else? Yeah. While reading, you have to become, yeah, he said, yes, the most creating he's ever done while reading. I think it's exactly right. There's no, you can't be a passive reader of Ulysses. You have to also be creatively filling in gaps as you go. And I think Joyce wanted us to do that. I'd also, I mean, maybe you could, you could also think about like this reframe the question, say, uh, is reading performance art, is, was writing it a, a certain, in a, in a way, performance art? Because this goes to Adam's point about, you know, not killing your darlings and putting them on, um, pedestals or, or thrones, which is that he and and I I talked to Colm Toyin about this uh, here, and he described it as scorched earth approach, which is take something, take take you know what is performance? Performance is I'm an actor trying on a role. So let's say you know third chapter, I'm a writer and I'm going to try on this habit of mine, habit of writing, which is what does the world look like if I close my eyes? Or what is the what would that look like on the page? Or what would that sound like? Um, so I think he is at, it's it's a um, performance writing in the sense, not in the kind of I think perf performative and performance has a kind of negative valence today. I mean, performance is literally um, I would love to know the kind of etymology of this, but it, I, I believe that the original meaning is just basically pretending to be something that you're not um and I think he's doing that all throughout the book he's he's saying you know I'm not this kind of writer this is not my kind of prose this is not my form but let me try it on let me bury it into the ground you know scorch earth idea I'm gonna just do it until the point of of no return <laughs> any latin scholars in the room who are gonna <laughs> I would I would actually say that forma means shape and pair means thoroughly. Oh, so well, perform means to, 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 no, I'm not really. I mean, I just, uh, but but if someone's going to who's smarter than me might correct me about this. But 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 to perform is to thoroughly shape. I think from Latin, maybe. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so thoroughly shape um, the the words. Yeah. It's lovely. Lovely. Other questions? Is someone from Zoom? Okay. Great. And again, we'll we'll get to everything in this episode, so no no one will be lost. Okay. Um, final question, let's say. Um, if Ulysses, this is from Michael James. If Ulysses was really meant to be a book for everybody, it's a failure, surely. Surely Joyce wasn't that serious about a very wide audience, mm. right? Well, I think that came, I think that came up a little bit in our conversation with De Declan Kybert, um, which is that it's not so much Joyce that failed, but society, our, our societies that failed Joyce. So he was writing in the early 20th century when it was a period of mass, the first period ever of mass literacy. It was also a period in which uh, autodidacticism, uh, speaks, being self-taught, was being encouraged among working people, in which if you worked for a factory, uh, this, well, there was a good chance there would be a reading library provided by the owner of a factory. This was uh, this was a time when there was hope for uh, everybody being lifted up through education and through reading. And I think in writing this book uh, and pitching it as it has been argued that he did at the, you know, as, as we talked about, as Declan Kybert mentioned, sort of uh, Virginia Woolf sort of slightly sneeringly said, you know, this is a book by and for a Dublin working man. Like, yeah, I think Joyce would have accepted that and I would have seen there was thought there was no shame in it. And the fact that today, perhaps the book doesn't reach the people that, you know, the equivalent of the people that Joyce claimed to be writing it for is more of a failure of our countries, our education systems, uh, capitalism, more broadly speaking. Our media, maybe too. Yeah, our media, absolutely. Um, so I would be, I would not lay it at, at, at Joyce's feet I would lay it on on the, the people who came after I mean even Shakespeare Dickens right great canonical figures 
were first appreciated by working people first, right? And then as, you know, as scholars, scholars are, I mean, I'm not against scholars, but I think it's actually the media plays a role in mystifying texts and saying something so hard. Like I, we talked about the Maureen Dowd article in New York Times about like, you know, Ulysses and Washington DC equally impenetrable. And I was just like, stop, like, you know, and she's doing a great books thing right now at Columbia, I think right there. It's like, don't use the word impenetrable. That's setting, that's telling people not to read James Joyce, you know? So I think there are people who have big platforms, you know, to use the, the, the current word, who are, who are contributing to the problem, right? And, and you should be actually, and I think that's what we're trying to do. It's what Shakespeare and Company stands for. It's what, that's what we've tried to do with this podcast is say, no, this belongs to everybody. So I think that, the, 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 again, we have to come back to Proteus, right? If you, if you imagine we can just go and just remove chapter three from Ulysses, right? Just whoop, just take, just take it away. Now, now look, imagine what the first eight chapters are like, right? Telemachus, hard to read? No. Nestor, Lots hard to fun. read? No. Yes. Calypso, he's talking to his cat. He's cooking breakfast. It's easy. Lotus eaters, he gets a letter from Martha. He looks at, you know, the languid flower. Not so hard to read. Hades, again, it's like a bunch of old Irish guys, you know, chatting in the, in the, in the carriage. Not so hard. Aeolus, it's fun, for Christ's sake. All the, all the, the newspaper headlines and stuff like that. Lestragonians, he's eating. He's talking about men, 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 and the munching. Okay, now once you get to the National Library and Scylla and Charybdis, then things start getting tricky. But What's the lesson from Skill and Shribdis? It's that don't take yourself so damn seriously. That's the whole point that Stephen comes to in his whole theory about Anne Hathaway and Shakespeare. He's, he can't even believe all of the nonsense coming out of his own mouth, right? So in a sense, if you've gotten that far, again, if, you've, if you haven't stopped because of Proteus, right? If you've gotten all the way to the National Library, it's, you, you realize, actually, this is not so bad. And the people who are taking themselves too seriously, Joyce also wants to make fun of them too. And then once you're past Wandering Rocks into Sirens and Cyclops, you're on a journey, right? Yeah. Then just buckle up and take the ride, right? And once you get to, you know, once you get to Circe and Ithaca, and then, then just take the ride. And I think once you're that far in, I don't see this as a, as a forbidding or impenetrable text at all. Again, just, the Proteus problem. Just very quickly, I think take the ride is a thing. It's sort of like you haven't understood everything, big deal. I think this, uh, this idea that we are supposed to understand everything that's going on in a text or it's not for us is incredibly damaging. You know, I think there is yeah. so much to be said for encountering texts which exist beyond us because it's going to provoke your curiosity and you're going to come back to it. Yeah, like I, I've this is now my third slash fourth time of reading the book, and it's you know, I still ha think I have a, I've got another ten or twenty times I'm going to have to read it to come anywhere close to what I would call like a a complete a full understanding of of the book, and that's fine. It's fine not to get everything. Take the ride, as you say, Lex. I think um, this is the final thing to say before we end here but then there are drinks and snacks and so we encourage you to to stay and mingle and talk and, and we'll chat more um i think the you know you're such a good point adam that it's our failure not his failure about how we think about literature and how literature is accessible or not i also think and this is departing we like to cite our sources in on the podcast this is departing from a following fuad's example yeah exactly of, of exactly. citing adam biles I, I, I can't remember the name of this author but it's a recent article in the financial times written by an economist um, who's basically, and I, I've actually got it here, so I'll just read this paragraph um, and then explain what I, what I would like to say. So he says, why do we find it so hard to accept that these two roles, so I would say that the frame here is that Joyce um, was the first person to open a, a cinema in Ireland. The Volta. The Volta. So the idea is like Joyce as, yes, brilliant writer, but also entrepreneur and businessman and man in the world, yeah? Why do we find it so hard to accept that these two roles, the artist and the entrepreneur, are not mutually exclusive? A century after Joyce's Ulysses introduced the world to a new sort of novel, the lazy idea of the indigent creative set, indignant, indignant, indigent, indigent, thank you, of the indigent <laughs> creative set against the uninspired commercial, the ingenious bohemian versus tedious bourgeois, remains as powerful as ever. So we have uh yeah creative set on in, indigent creative set on the one hand and uninspired commercial on the other remains as powerful as ever yet as joyce's cinema ventured showed the mind that wrote ulysses was also the mind that opened ireland's first cinema the same thing could be said of shakespeare who owned a theater who was a businessman who who wanted to make money who was interested in making money who retired early 
with his money that he made to Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, I think we've also failed, uh, we've put these books in a case, but we've also put the minds who created the books in this glass case as if they weren't preoccupied with, with the vicissitudes of life. And this would be a nice way to end because you said something lovely about me at the beginning. I'd like to say something lovely about you, both of you, which is that um, I think especially men, you know, men, men, men in, in Australians, especially men, uh, and again, this is kind of like society rewarding us for being brilliant minds and not really attending to our family lives or our personal lives or our financial lives. You know, that there's a whole kind of mythos about the great genius on the mount who doesn't eat, who doesn't need money, who doesn't need sex, who doesn't need love, who doesn't have children, whose children don't hate him, whatever. Um, I think Joyce, whose daughter Lucia had a nervous breakdown, uh, who loved so much his wife, who owned the cinema, who was thinking about business and thinking about his sales as much as anyone reminds us of this, and working this spring with Adam and Lex, who, um, you know, uh, who cared so deeply about their families the whole way through, who were doing such brilliant intellectual work in their own lives and who you know, couldn't meet on Zoom because he had to pick up his daughter from creche or couldn't meet um, on week four because you know, there was an ultrasound um, happening on that day. You know, These two men and Joyce are an example of, of, of being brilliant intellects and actually stepping up for your personal life. I don't think they're irreconcilable and I think it's that um, balance that makes for a really wonderful person. So. Thank you so much for spending this spring with me.